all sugar is created equally. Mm -hmm. And this is an interesting thing. This feel, this kind of felt like voodoo when I first looked at it, but there's interesting, very significant amounts of medical literature that show, and this, why should this be confusing or surprising to us from an evolutionary ancestral perspective? That for some reason, I don't think anybody really understands this, processed sugar is not the same as honey that's raw or fruit in the human body. I mean, there's a really interesting study by Rick Johnson, who's done a lot of work with fructose. And so Rick took two groups of people who were going to lose weight, and both groups had low amounts of calories. So they were both hypocaloric. But one group cut out fructose completely, right? No fructose, no fruit. And one group had 400 to 500 calories of fruit per day, but cut out all processed fructose in their diet. And both groups lost weight and both groups saw improvements in metabolic markers and liver fat. So there are multiple points that I want to make about the study. The inclusion of fruit, but the exclusion of all processed fructose, high fructose corn syrup, was just as beneficial metabolically as the exclusion of all fructose for these people. And the group that had fruit, but no processed fructose, actually lost more weight than the group that cut out fructose completely and ate no fruit. That's so, interesting. So it's a, the study, I think, in, in this hypocaloric setting, right, fruit wasn't damaging for people in any way, shape, or form. It actually was equivalent or better to have some fructose in the form of fruit. There are studies with honey that show that when you give people raw honey, but not pasteurized honey, you get an increase in nitric oxide precursors in the human mm -hmm. body. Now, nitric oxide is critical. It's this simple molecule, NO, that's used and made in the endothelial cells to cause vasodilatation. If you want healthy endothelium inside your blood vessels, that's how you get that kind of um, fortified wall that doesn't really pull in LDL. You need to have robust amounts of nitric oxide being made in the endothelium, and that's how you know you have healthy endothelium. You can look at that vasodilatory response. Well, honey increases the vasodilatory response in humans. It increases nitric oxide. That's good for our penises, our blood vessels, you know, everywhere else that has a blood vessel, your heart, your lung, everything, your brain. So, okay, that's kind of cool. That's really beneficial for honey. I mean, raw honey has been used to treat cavities. It's been used to treat oral mucositis, infection in the mouth. Raw honey has been used to treat it. So why are we not surprised, right? This is a totally ancestral food. When I was in Tanzania with the Hadza, they love this stuff. And you pull it out of the tree, it's about as raw as Didn't it gets. Did they have a bird that shows them where... Is that the same, yeah, same the, group? The, the, the honey guide, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, they didn't, the, gr the group of Hadza that I was with didn't use the honey guide when I was there, but I wanted to see them do it. But I've heard other people ask them, and, and the lore is that, the way this works, people don't know, is that the, the bird comes and shows the humans where the honey is. It, it chirps and it says there's a hive in this tree and the Hadza, the Bushmen, I think at the Hadza, maybe the, maybe the, the Ikung of um, Botswana also do this too. And, and then they give some to the bird. And there's this lore within the community that if you don't give some to the bird, that the bird might lead you to a tree with a snake in it or something in the future. But yeah, there's, there's this, there's <laughs> this like interesting that. connection with the, 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 these birds. But they didn't even need the bird when I was in Tanzania. They just walked around and they could see these. There were two types of bees in Tanzania. One was a stingless bee. And there are these little flutes, these little straws that they make. They have this incredible... Um, hidden hives inside the tree. And the only thing you see is this little straw, like a wax straw that comes out that they make. And these little tiny bees that don't sting go in and out. And they see that little, you see that little straw and then they take out the ax. And I mean, they displace the bees from there <laughs> because this is human <laughs> Sorry, interactions with the environment. The <laughs> but yeah, there's a video on my social media of me chopping into a tree. Maybe we'll put some of that in the podcast here. There's a video of me chopping into the tree with the Hadza. And th this was some of the best honey I've ever had in my life. And it's, so honey is, is beneficial. And the point here that I'm making is just not all sugars created equally. And it doesn't like there's, there's the flip side is that there's pretty good evidence that if you get rid of processed sugar from the diet of kids, they get more metabolically healthy in an isocaloric setting. So Robert Lustig has done this work where they took obese teens who were metabolically unwell. So we know that even today, teenagers have insulin resistance mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Perhaps processed sugar is one of those reasons. But if you get rid of that processed sugar from those teens' lives and you change nothing else and they eat the same amount of calories, they get metabolically healthy. So people who are against fructose would say, look at that, fructose is bad for humans. But they need to, I think we need to consider both sides and realize, okay, but you can also give humans fruit and they're not going to have a problem with that. So not all sugar is created equally. And I don't think that it's 
fruit and honey that cause diabetes for humans. Uh, processed sugar, I think most people would agree, this has no place in the human diet. You know, there's there's a really interesting study, and then I'll 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 shut up and stop rambling. Uh, it's always good to talk. I just get excited about talking yeah, about things with you. I love how pumped you are, brother. <laughs> Fucking run, 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 run. Let's go. There's a great study that Matt that Matt not. Uh, I think it's what's his first name? Is it Matt Hall? I'll think of his first name. Anyway, they took two groups of people. You'll love this one, and they they put them in a metabolic ward, so they they control everything these people eat. And I think it was maybe 20 people in each group, and one group gets entirely unprocessed food. So they had like salmon and chicken and and beef and vegetables and fruit, no processing. The other group gets processed food, right? So cookies, cakes, whatever. Um, probably hamburgers with buns and sauce. And, and they give both groups of people the same amount of calories on the tray to start. And they try to match the presented food for fiber, salt, sugar, uh, caloric density. So the presented food to these people is almost exactly the same, except for one thing, which I'll talk about in a moment, because they couldn't control for this. But what happened was that this is an ad lib study, which is the perfect recreation of what happens in the natural world. Because people could say, I'm still hungry, I want more, or I'm good. What happened was that the people who had the unprocessed food ate about 500 calories less per day and lost two pounds over two weeks. The people who had the processed food ate 500 more calories per day and gained two pounds over two weeks. So why are these people hungrier? So we know at the first level, we know that processed food is not as satiating as regular food calorie for calorie, gram for gram of macronutrients, carbohydrates, protein, fat are matched, sugar's matched, salt is matched, fiber is matched. It's not as satiating. It makes you hungry. Mm -hmm. And then- Because it's been engineered to do so. It's been engineered to do so. But how did they do that, right? Yeah. But I think at a high level, you can look at that processed food. And this is something that we've termed the, 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 the fat triad, right? It's, it's seed oils, it's processed sugar, and it's processed grains. Almost everyone can agree that those are three common elements of processed food. So I think if most people are listening to this and everything we said about LDL went over their head and everything we're going to say about seed oils is too technical, if you simply eliminate those three things from your diet, seed oils, processed sugars, and processed milled grains and flours, you're essentially not eating any processed foods and your health will improve. A end of story. It's just when the rubber meets the road, people realize how hard it is to do that because that's in everything. Mm -hmm. But those three elements are so key. And so I have a suspicion that that processed sugar, because we know it's in that processed food, is somehow obesogenic. But I definitely believe that the seed oils are the main driver of that. And there's a really interesting story about seed oils and satiety that we can talk about if you want.